Hey everyone, uh, we are in chapter two, The Cell. Uh, we're starting on slide 16. This is uh, right after we discussed other components of the cell, like the plasma, plasma membrane, uh, things that you find in the plasma membrane, like phospholipids, cholesterol, and proteins. And we also discussed different microscopy types. In fact, in this uh, picture here, um, in this, yeah, in this picture here, you can see in a whole cell, we have this structure in the middle, dark, it stains darker and it's usually round. You can see this structure in really high detail using a transmission electron microscope. That's what TEM stands for. So we can see this with really high detail. This structure that we're looking at here, this is the nucleus. The word nucleus, you see that term in many different contexts in this class and in science in general, like the nucleus of an atom is where you have the protons and neutrons, or uh, the nucleus of your family is your, like your, your parents and your, your siblings, if you have any. Um, nucleus just means like the center of something, the core of something. So the nucleus of a cell is looks like the center of the cell because it's big and round and stains dark. That's why it's called the nucleus. The nucleus functionally acts as a control center. If we go back to that factory analogy, if you're a, if you're a factory, you're probably making something. Uh, to make the thing you're making, let's say we're a box factory. We want to make boxes. I know, exciting. Um, you need a blueprint. You need a you need some instructions on how to make that thing, on how to make boxes. Uh, so some person or something needs to have those instructions. The nucleus is the storage area for the instructions. The nucleus is the storage area for the instructions. The instructions are in the form of a molecule. That molecule is DNA. It stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Don't worry about that not at least for this class. Um, we can talk about that later if you'd like. But the instructions are in the form of a molecule, the special sequence of a molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's from these instructions that we can then read it to construct a protein. The, the factory of a cell, the cell is a factory. What we're making in cells are proteins. There, there's actually more stuff that we make, but one major thing we make in our cells are proteins. <clears throat> One thing I want to point out here about this nucleus is that the outer covering of it is a membrane. And membranes, just like the plasma membrane, it's made up of phospholipids and other things, but primarily phospholipids. That will be an important idea coming up, that this is a membranous organelle made of phospholipids and then the DNA is stored in here. The DNA is stored inside and protected. It's a really value, valuable set of instructions. You want to protect it and hold it. You don't want to leave it. Just like if you have really important things you put in the safe, lock it up. The nucleus is kind of like that. You don't want the DNA to get out. You want to protect it. So DNA are just instructions. We have to be able to read the instructions and then take it to a workbench, so to speak, and then construct our proteins. DNA are instructions to make proteins. DNA does not turn into proteins. You have to read the instructions, read the DNA, and then use building blocks to make the proteins. So what happens is, and we're skipping over a few steps here because it's not important to anatomy at least, um, you take a you take a, a transcript, so to speak. You take a transcript of the DNA. We, we don't want to take the DNA out of the nucleus, but we can take the transcript out of the nucleus, which is like a carbon copy of the, of the DNA. And then that transcript can be read by another organelle called ribosomes. Ribosomes are these tiny organelles. The way that they're pictured here in this picture are these dots. These dots are the ribosomes. 
Ribosomes are tiny organelles. They're the ones that synthesize proteins. They make the proteins. The word synthesis means to construct, to build. Um, Ribosomes read the transcript of, the, of what was DNA, it's called RNA now. They read the transcript and they make proteins. Many of these ribosomes are freely floating in the cytosol, but then another group of them end up attached to this membranous organelle that I'm gonna color in dark blue. This membranous organelle that's usually surrounding the nucleus this membranous organelle is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Really long, confusing name, but let's break it down. It will make sense. The word rough, it looks rough. When you look at it under a, here's another transmission electron micrograph. When you look at it under the transmission electron microscope, you can see the membrane. It is a membranous organelle, the, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And it looks rough because you have those ribosomes attached to the membrane. That's why it's rough. Endo means inside. Endo means inside. Plasmic means inside of the plasma membrane. So it's really inside of the cell. Reticulum is a generic word for a network of something. So we have a, a network of membranes inside of the cell that appear rough because they have ribosomes attached to them, rough endoplasmic reticulum. The ribosomes are the ones making the protein. What do we need the rough endoplasmic reticulum for? What the rough endoplasmic reticulum does is that it processes or folds the proteins. When, you, uh, when you're making a box, let's go back to that example. If you're a box factory and you make a box, one of the first things you'll do is you'll lay out the cardboard and then you'll cut it in the specific pattern that you need. So it's not folded yet. But once you've cut out your pattern, let this restart. <laughs> once you've cut out your pattern, then you can fold it into the right shape. Once you've cut out your pattern, then you can fold it into the right shape. That folding process is what the rough endoplasmic reticulum does. If we're looking at this bottom right animation, there it goes. We take a long two-dimensional or even one-dimensional-ish string of protein and we fold it up into a three-dimensional thing that has shape, that has volume and shape. That's the goal of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It processes, it folds proteins into a three-dimensional functional shape. Ribosomes make the protein, rough endoplasmic reticulum folds it and makes it functional. Once you've got your product, <clears throat> we need to figure out where it goes. So the next organelle that we need is for that, is for shipping, sorting and shipping. This next organelle is called the Golgi complex. You're going to see this person's name come up, important scientist. Um, Golgi is a person's name. Uh, the Golgi complex, it's an area. That's why it's called complex. You might even see this called, uh, what is it, Golgi body or Golgi apparatus. It all means the same thing. But the Golgi complex is a membranous organelle, so it's made of phospholipids. It's a membranous organelle that sorts and ships proteins. In this simplified picture, whoops, in the simplified picture at the top right, we would have DNA inside of the nucleus. We can't take DNA out of the nucleus, so we need our transcript. It's called RNA. That's what this thing is. That RNA transcript is read. It, we read the instructions with ribosomes.
And when they read the when the ribosomes read that transcript, it can then construct a protein. And that protein, which I'm going to color in blue here, that protein gets processed, it gets folded. inside of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The fold, we now have a folded, nearly functional, maybe even fully functional protein. Now that we have this protein, we need to send it to the, to the Golgi complex so that we can figure out where, it, where it's supposed to go. The way that we send it to the Golgi is by pinching off, pinching off membrane from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. I said that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is membranous. It's made of membrane. It's made of phospholipids. And phospholipids are very fluid-like. They can get pinched and it can kind of tear off. So now you have this spherical, it's called a vesicle. You have this spherical thing called a vesicle that gets pinched off and it contains protein and whatever other fluid that got caught with it. This vesicle can move away from the rough endoplasmic reticulum to our Golgi complex. And because the Golgi is also membranous, it's also made of phospholipids, it can just fuse together. And that's what's going on in this view right here. It's fusing together. The vesicle is fusing with the Golgi apparatus, with the Golgi complex. So now the proteins are inside of the Golgi and the Golgi can read, it'll, there are some special molecular tags on the proteins. The Golgi complex can read it and decide where it goes. The proteins that, that our cells make can go to one of three places. These proteins that we make can either go somewhere in the cell because our cells need proteins to function. Proteins have a million different functions. It could leave the cell, or remember we talked about how there are proteins in the, in the plasma membrane. We have receptors, we have transport proteins. They could be incorporated into the membrane. Those are the three major places where our proteins can go. And the Golgi reads our proteins and figures out where they need to be sent. If they do leave the cell, so if we follow, if we follow this pathway that I'm coloring in green, this process of the vesicle fusing with the plasma membrane, because the plasma membrane is also made of membrane, it's all phospholipids that can just be interchanged. This process is called exocytosis, where a vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane and anything inside of the vesicle leaves. That's what this animation is showing. I need to erase a little bit here. This animation is showing in blue are the proteins. Here's a vesicle, it fuses with the plasma membrane and anything that was inside exits and is released to the outside, to the interstitial fluid. This is exocytosis happening. Note that anything that was inside of the vesicle exits and leads to the interstitial fluid. But anything that was on the vesicle like this red thing here, say this is a protein, anything that was on the vesicle now gets incorporated into the plasma membrane. We can add proteins to the plasma membrane through this process of exocytosis. So exocytosis can be used to release stuff to the outside and it can be used to add stuff to the membrane. So far, everything that we've just discussed from the nucleus, ribosomes, rough endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex, all this has to do with protein making. Um, because once again, proteins are super important to the functioning of a the cell. They're more for than just moving the muscles, which they are for, and we'll get to that later. 
but there's a million other uses for proteins. The next organelles that we're going to discuss don't necessarily deal with proteins, at least not directly. There's other things that our factories need to do. If you're, if you're a factory and you're making boxes or you're making a car, you're focusing on making those cars or, or boxes, but you also need a cleanup crew, you need security, you need some way to keep, a, keep power going. There's other things going on in that factory. For our cells, we make proteins, but we also process lipids. Lipids, remember, are a different class of molecules. The organelle to help us process, assemble lipids, this is called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. In this illustration, uh, you can see the rough endoplasmic reticulum here, and then you can see the smooth one over here. It's called smooth because it doesn't have ribosomes. And since it doesn't have ribosomes, it therefore does not have anything to do with protein processing. The rough endoplasmic reticulum does, not the smooth one. Um, the, smooth yeah, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum helps assemble lipids. So when you eat, uh, eat anything that has some fat in it, your cells that absorb these um, lipids will help process it and put it into a useful form. But it can also help us process toxins. Uh, an example of a toxin that's commonly consumed by Americans is alcohol. If, um, <clears throat> if alcohol, or really anyone, lots of people in the world, but alcohol, it's processed by the, by the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it gets converted to a different molecule because alcohol is damaging to our cells. Um, that's why you can find high uh, quantities of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in your liver cells. The liver is important for detoxifying things that it finds in your blood. Another organelle that we have uh, is called a lysosome. The, we, we talked about ribosomes. The word some just means body. The word lyse, L-Y-S-E, not L-I-C-E. L-Y-S-E -L -Y -S -E means to break apart to break something, to lice. So lysosomes are these organelles that break other things down. Um, if we take a look at this diagram down here, pictured where I just circled, that's a lysosome. So a lysosome are these circular spherical structures inside of cells. Uh, let's say, Let's say you're a white blood cell. So pictured uh, here is a white blood cell. This white blood cell this white blood cell will, can eat something up. And that's what's being pictured uh, in um, greater detail here on the left, but then in, in less detail here on the right. It can eat something up by the, pretty much the reverse process of exocytosis. This special type of eating is called phagocytosis. It's eating up something by engulfing it and bringing in a membranous organ, a vesicle. We have a vesicle forming. <clears throat> when it eats that thing up, when it eats that thing up, you can see uh, an example down here. Here's the vesicle. The lysosome can fuse together with the vesicle. The lysosome can fuse together with the vesicle. And now anything that was inside of the lysosome can mix together with anything that was inside of that vesicle. The lysosome contains digestive enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that help break things down. Well, in this case, they're digestive enzymes, so they help break things down. There are other different types of enzymes, but digestive enzymes help break things down. And so it will help break down the particles that our cells just ate. Uh, this is an animation of a white blood cell chasing a bacterium, engulfing it by phagocytosis, and then it will digest it by, with the help of these lysosomes. 
Lysosomes aren't just needed for white blood cells. It's not just needed for cells that can undergo this phagocytosis. All the time, our cells need to break things down. It could be our own organelles. Our organelles don't last forever. They, they need to be recycled. And we can break it, say we have old, um, say we have an old uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, we could eat that up, break it down, digest it, and use the component parts again. Uh, for whatever, for making new rough endoplasmic reticulum or, or other organelles. <clears throat> Next organelle, uh, might have heard of it. It's the mitochondrion. That's singular. Singular is mitochondrion, plural is mitochondria. It is the powerhouse of the cell, it does convert energy. Um, the way it does that in a nutshell is through a series of chemical reactions. That series of chemical reactions is collectively known as cellular respiration. And the end result that we care about of cellular respiration is the production of this molecule called ATP. It's the energy molecule. We could go into much more detail about this. We're not going to. You probably do that more in physiology. What I want you to know about the mitochondrion, as this is an anatomy class after all, is its shape and how its shape relates to its function. You've got many mitochondria in your cells. They're kind of big, but not that big. What's unique about them is the way they're shaped. So there are these ovally shaped things. They are membranous, but there's an outer membrane. And then if you look closely, there's also a highly folded inner membrane. By having that highly folded inner membrane, that means you have more surface area in a smaller space. Sound familiar? We talked about that with the brain in chapter one. There's more surface area in a smaller space you have more efficiency, specifically for more chemical reactions. By having a highly folded inner membrane in the mitochondria, we have more space for more chemical reactions. If we have more chemical reactions, we produce more ATP, more energy to keep our cells going because our cells use up a lot of energy. So yes, the mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. <clears throat> Many of the organelles that we just discussed, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, um, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex, uh, lysosomes, uh, mitochondria, they all have membranes. They all are, have phospholipids uh, forming their outer surface. Some structures like ribosomes, ribosomes are not made of membranes. And this next cell structure also is not made of membranes. It's not made of lipids as its primary or primary molecule. This structure is known as the cytoskeleton. As the name suggests, cyto is part of the cell. Skeleton is providing a framework. Just like how we have a skeleton made of bones, this isn't bones, but it's providing a framework. Unlike our skeleton, which when we're adults, doesn't really change much in size. It actually is very dynamic, but it doesn't change much in size when we're adults. This cytoskeleton of cells can change a lot. Here's uh, a time-lapse of a cell dividing. You see one cell splitting into two. In order to do that, it has to change its shape drastically. The cytoskeleton is what allows for movement of the cell as well as movement of things inside of the cell. We wanna move organelles often from one place to another. This picture at the bottom right, this is highlighting using special fluorescence microscopy, so you're using special tags. Uh, so highlighting there in yellow and in purple, um, these are components of the cytoskeleton spread throughout the cell. They're providing, it's like a bunch of railways and framework for the cell and it's very changeable. The cytoskeleton is made up primarily of proteins. There's several proteins that make it up. I'm just gonna go over one. One of the major proteins that make up the cytoskeleton, they are called microtubules. 
Micro, meaning they're small. Tubules, they're tube-shaped. Microtubules are one of the proteins that make up the cytoskeleton. Um, so you can find that in this picture here. But microtubules can also make up two specialized structures that some cells have. I say special structures because some cells have them, not all cells. Some cells have these things called cilia or singular cilium. Um, there's two important places that I'd like you to know where you can find cilia. You can find cilia in the uterine tube. The uterine tube in the female reproductive system is for, well, the uterine tube is for passing an ovulated egg from the ovaries into the uterus. So it's to make its journey that way. To help the egg along, these cilia are on the surface of these cells and they sweep, they sweep egg and egg towards the uterus. So these cilia are movable structures and providing the, the extension, the movable extension, there are microtubules inside of these cilia. You can also find cilia in our respiratory system. These cilia, say, lining our trachea, they are sweeping mucus. They are sweeping mucus up and out. So say you breathe in, because air is never perfectly pure, say you breathe in a particle or some dust or whatever, and it gets, you want it to get caught in the mucus. You'd rather it not get down to deeper parts of your lungs, otherwise you could have damage or an infection. But it gets caught in the mucus, your cilia sweep the mucus up and you cough out phlegm, which is a good and normal thing. You wanna be doing that all the time. And it can be, and it's helped by the movement of these cilia. So microtubules are within these cilia. One other structure that make that cilia make up, they make up flagella or singular flagellum. There's only one human cell that has a flagellum. They can be found in other organisms, but there's only one human cell that has a flagellum and that's the sperm. The tail of the sperm, that's called a flagellum. It's larger, it's larger than cilia. Cilia are these really tiny hair-like extensions. There's one relatively larger flagellum for sperm and it helps it swim around. It can also help with sensation as well for the sperm, like knowing and detecting where it's going. But primary thing is, as you might know, is for it to help, to help it swim around. So those are the major uh, cell structures that I would like you to know. There's actually more, but, and we'll get to a few more as we get to them. Um, but those are the major ones that pretty much every cell in your body has. There's of course some exceptions, but they all, your cells pretty much have all of these, uh, no matter what, it, what cell it is, whether it's a neuron or a muscle cell or a skin cell. Like a factory, you need some, some control center. The DNA are the instructions and you wanna protect it. You need a workbench, you need ribosomes to, to construct your proteins. You need uh, a way to process them. So you have, you have uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you have the Golgi, you ship it out with the help of the, with the, help of the Golgi and you send it out of the plasma membrane. Um, you need a way to power everything, you need ribosomes. You need to get rid of waste. That's what the lysosomes are for. Every single structure in your cells has a role. Just like in a manufacturing plant, there's specialization and that keeps everything in line. That keeps everything running smoothly when it's all going to plan. All right, that's the cell. We have more to discuss with microscopy, which we'll do in lab. And um, we'll talk more about mitosis and differentiation in the next videos. Please let me know if you have any questions, leave questions in the discussion and talk, talk with others uh, and rewatch this if this was, uh, if you need a second go, but uh, let me know if you do, do have questions. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you all later.